We're here in Westminster with MP Hugh Merriman for Bexhill and Battle, who's actually my local MP. So thank you very much for taking the time out to talk to us um, here on the Brighton Broadcasting News uh, Network for our University of Brighton. So really, what I wanted to do was to ask you some questions about Brexit. You're quite vocal on Brexit and you, you've been on Twitter and, and elsewhere talking about that. I mean, how did you feel about the campaign? And, 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 and also, how did you feel about the, the, the result that happened on the 23rd of June on that, on that particular fateful day, some would say? Oh, well, firstly, Chris, thank, welcome to, to Westminster as a constituent. Um, in terms of the referendum back in 2016, I decided to take, I think it was a bit of a novel approach for MPs. Uh, most MPs um, back to campaign uh, to either remain or leave and got stuck in. Um, I decided not to do that. Um, I wrote to 40,000 households, so all of my constituents, um, invited them to come to a series of debates and listen to the arguments either side. Um, and I also gave them... Um, copies of uh, materials that they could actually look through so they could see what the arguments were either for or against because I ultimately felt that as an MP when you have a referendum it's not for MPs to go around telling people what to do that's the whole idea of a referendum so I was really passionate about helping people come to their decision in each debate I spent a little bit of time explaining what article 50 would meant if we leave um, which I have to say I didn't expect to be talking about again Um, (laughs) but also I talked uh, about what the process would be if we ended up in a reformed EU, which of course is what David Cameron was uh, campaigning for. Um, And then when it came to the vote, I voted to remain, um, made that known to people just before the vote as well. But again, didn't want to influence them. So that was my role, but I always made it quite clear that I would maintain um, and stick by the result, whoever sort of won the day. Um, And I also enjoyed the time because I was listening to both sides of the arguments because I was helping people. And I think a lot of MPs were too busy campaigning They now think they actually know what people really wanted, but actually they're only listening to themselves because they were so driven and biased one way or the other. So my whole approach now that we are leaving is to get behind it and actually to really embrace the majority of the vote because ultimately as an MP, I'm here by the ballot box. If I actually reject that ballot box because it doesn't deliver the decision I wanted, then that's quite perverse for an MP to say that. And I wish some of my colleagues would take the same view. Well, that's a good point. Um, and also, just quickly on, Be- on Bex Hill and Battle, what were the main issues that were coming out of, of, the, of your constituents? Well, so actually, Chris, that's another thing which I find annoying when I listen to people in the chamber, uh, because they seem to think that people are duped. Now, actually, my constituents uh, tend to be, on the whole, retired, um, actually tend to be uh, in, an intelligent constituency um, in terms of their backgrounds, their professions. Um, and the bulk of them were telling me that they wanted to leave because they wanted to regain sovereignty. So for this place, this place makes the laws, then it's all your fault if, if it doesn't go right rather than blaming it on another institution. So it wasn't immigration, it wasn't sort of some of the more basic issues that people tend to raise. It really tended to be about wanting to regain control of sovereignty. Um, and that was what people seem to sort of have a real strong desire for in Bexhill and Battle constituency. Which, which is interesting because, of course, you mentioned that, that, that they're a retired demographic or an electorate. And, of course, some of those would have actually voted in the original 1973 uh, referendum to actually join. So we've talked to quite a few people who've, who've talked about that. And they actually feel that it drifted away from the original idea where sovereignty was, well, was basically ceded to Europe. Is that something that they would have uh, talked about? That came up a lot during the debates. So people would say, look, I, I voted uh, to enter um, the EEC, as it then was back there, uh, but it was, this wasn't what I, I, I voted for. It was an economic trading partnership, not sort of uh, dilution of sovereignty. So yes, that came up a lot. And it was quite interesting, the sheer numbers that had voted the first time to enter, but actually it wasn't what they wanted, so now they wanted to leave. And also I think that there's an issue there because um, some of the people I'm talking about here, they have vast experience in what life was like before, and therefore they have great confidence that it will all be okay afterwards because they've seen it before as well. And I think we should listen to that experience. It should be reassuring to us. That's true. And, and we've heard a lot about uh, the Commonwealth and basically re- restoring trade with the Commonwealth that, that, we used to, that, that we used to have, as well as the new countries that are, seeding, uh, are trying to recede to the Commonwealth. Um, do you have a view on the Commonwealth and our trade, uh, potential future trade with them post-Brexit? Well, I do, because I think it's quite interesting. One of the, we have to give people a positive reason um, for why life after Brexit will be, a, a, you know, a, an opportunity, not just for us, but also for the people that we interact with around the world. At the moment, we're very much part of a club of 28 members who look after themselves, relatively wealthy if you look at the rest of the world's population. And often that club shuts out poorer countries. 
Uh, and those, many of those countries, as you say, are Commonwealth countries that we previously used to be very much linked to. Still are, but actually many would say in the early 70s we left them behind in order to join our wealthier 28. So I think this is an opportunity for us to rebuild trade with Commonwealth countries, but also other poorer countries from around the world and really help them um, trade and bring themselves up. So they don't want a handout, they actually want a hand up, they want to trade with us. And the European Union, I'm afraid, does tend to look at itself. It's quite insular and it doesn't really look at the bigger world population. I think that's actually, that's not how life should be right now. Some parties are actually advocating a second referendum, not for whether it's in or out, but whether or not we agree to the terms of the Brexit deal that's inching closer uh, as of yesterday. Um, what do you think on that? I feel that's a bit of a smokescreen for actually can we just not have any of this Brexit at all uh, and I wish people would be more straight because I remember clearly the day of the referendum and there was a lady I spoke to a constituent of mine who said I'm genuinely confused I just don't really understand it and quite frankly I feel a bit cross that MPs have given us this responsibility um, it, it just seems to be the type of thing we elect you to do and I thought that was quite interesting on what for many could be a gut feeling but many people actually went all the way around of quite a complex process and then it may have come back to a gut feeling if you ask people here's a big negotiated document, here's our deal, here's our legislation, look through it and let us know if you think that's okay. It's impossible. People will find that incredible challenge and they will actually be very cross with politicians expecting them to do that as well. That's why they voted for us to actually put this deal together. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, that is just a smokescreen for trying to unpick. Because when something is actually too complex, then the gut feeling is to say, well, actually, I won't vote for it because I don't really follow it. And that's, I think, what would actually happen. So I wish MPs would be more honest. If they actually don't want this to go ahead, then they should stand up and say so, rather than saying, can we have another referendum? Another point, what if people do say to the Prime Minister, actually, we don't really like this particular page, go back and fix it? How do you, how do you reverse a two-year negotiation process and send the Prime Minister back. You'll only weaken our position. So actually it's doing us down as a country as well. So my view is we've had a vote, we stick with the result even if people don't like it. I didn't vote for it either but I'm going to make it the best fist out of it because that's what we do in this country and we don't try and unpick it and MPs should lead by example. And post-Brexit as well, and trying to, to really sort of make a deal with Europe, uh, there is talk of a, a Canada Plus type of deal that includes services and banking and things like that that are really important to the UK. Um, do you think that Europe are really sort of circling and waiting for, for us to cave in perhaps on, uh, on, on allowing services into a post-Brexit deal? I mean, that's the big issue. Can we actually get financial services into this deal as well? Um, and it makes sense for us. I think we get a bit... T tied up with Canada Plus, Canada Plus Plus, um, all these different options. The reality is we already have a trading um, agreement in place with the European Union in terms of the European Union terms. We want to try and replicate as much of that as we can so that we are free to trade on all services and goods, so yes, financial services included, but also free to travel, free to live, um, free to study as well. Those are all really important and there's no reason why we can't do it because we do at the moment there's a real desire of both peoples to continue to do this. So effectively, what the negotiation teams should be doing is delivering what their peoples actually want them to do, which is to continue to, to work, trade um, and provide services to each other. Um, and I, I'm ultimately optimistic that we can do that. And in a, in a way, it will only be successful if we come up with our own model rather than trying to replicate other countries which may be more particular and specific to their own circumstances. Um, we already know what our trading relationship should be because we've got it right now. And finally, thank you very much for your time. Really, I just want to know about your, your feelings on digital and social media, such as Facebook or YouTube or anything else, when it comes to communicating with your electorate. And I think that especially in Bexhill and Battle, where perhaps, you know, they don't use Facebook or YouTube as often as, as perhaps other constituencies that may be younger or, or more connected. What do you think of that? Well, actually, I'm not sure that's accurate because um, if you've got a, a more of a, a retired demographic, then people tend to actually have more time and they do tend to engage more. And actually, Facebook is something that I think they use a lot. We had quite an interesting statistic. We had a new Weatherspoons open. Um, and again, with our sort of more um, retired clientele, um, Weatherspoons reported they got more people ordering off their app than actually any other pub they've, they've opened. And so that would actually demonstrate that, that people of all ages are actually using the same technology. And so the question is, how do I engage on that basis? I have to say, actually, I, I'm not a sort of huge Facebook um, user. Um, I tend to use social media because I think it's important to be able to get my message across. But I think politicians make a big mistake when they say, we've got to use social media. Actually, what you've got to do is communicate. And if social media is just another way of communicating, 
then fine. But some people are more obsessed with doing something on social media than effective communication across social media, which ultimately is going to be uh, ending up with you not getting your voice across at all. Yeah. So I tend to use the same um, modes of communication that most politicians are, but what we've always been told is the most effective way to get your message across is regional TV and also on the BBC. Yeah. So as chairman of the all-party parliamentary group for the BBC, hopefully I can do that well. Uh, but I just think it's a lesson to us all. People are changing the way that they actually use um, and, and listen to views, I should say. So the trick for politicians is to actually use all platforms so that we're getting through to as many people as we can. I think that a lot of, of, of politicians are making maybe a mistake by only engaging on social media and engaging with activists who are already on social media. Um, what do you think of that? I think your point is spot on. And I'll also, there's another general point. When I have constituency surgeries, people tend to actually come to me with difficult challenges, bad news, things that might be negative. And if you're not careful, you can actually think that everybody actually has that feeling that things are bad. Social media is another example of that. People tend to use it to, to complain, criticise more than to actually praise. So what I tend to do is I knock on an entire street of doors and I ask them how they are, how are things. Most people will say actually things are well, please don't muck it up, muck it up. Um, rather than actually I'm finding this particularly problematic or I really don't like your policies on this. And so it's really important for us that we actually sample a representative base of our constituents and not just listen to the noise and social media I'm afraid amplifies that noise and it doesn't necessarily give us the true feeling as to how our constituents are so that's why I'm quite wary of social media it has its role but if I want to find a true sample of my constituency I'll knock on doors I'll speak to people it's old-fashioned and it still works